There is a new repo market warning signal. I'm going to explain what it means and how it will most likely affect your financial future. I'm going to do this in three simple, fast steps. Step number one, let's go over some of the shocking numbers that have been coming out just this week in the repo market. This is a chart, starts in 2020. January goes all the way to pretty much today's date in May 2021. On the left, we go from zero up to $500 billion. This chart indicates the Fed's reverse repurchase agreements in the marketplace. And if you don't exactly understand the difference between a repo transaction and a reverse repo, or if you don't even know what a repo is, <laughs> don't worry, we're going to get to that in step number two. But you can see how it spikes up to over $300 billion right at the beginning of the Cervasis sickness in March of 2020. And then it comes back down and we go months, maybe six, seven months in here, where there's literally zero repo transactions. But then we get to May and it goes absolutely parabolic. It gets to a level much higher than it was even during the panic at the beginning of the Cervasis sickness in March of 2020. So a very simple way to look at this chart is to understand how close we were to a collapse back in 2020. And if this is our line going across here, we can assume that anything above that line is really getting into the no bueno zone. <laughs> a technical term I use all the time. So if that's right here, you got to look, we're almost twice that high right now. Some specific numbers back here, we were about 300 billion. Now we are over $400 billion a day in reverse repos with the Fed. We're starting to see cracks in the system. Something is obviously broken. To dive into this even deeper, let's go right to the internet. Okay, this is a Reuters article that is titled Fed Reverse Repo Volume Sparks Worries U.S. Short-Term Rates Could Go Below Zero. In other words, negative interest rates at the short end of the yield curve. But believe it or not, I don't think that's what's most concerning about this topic of reverse repos. And we're going to get into that more in step number two and three. But let's just focus on what has been happening right now in the repo market, according to this article. Volume at the Fed's overnight reverse repo window surged to $433 billion on Tuesday, according to the New York Fed data. Analysts said this was the third largest uptake ever, the biggest being $474 billion on December 31st, 2015. And I want to point out this $474 billion daily transaction number came at the end of a quarter. And that's a big, big difference. What we're seeing right now is happening at a time where there shouldn't be significant strain on the system. Back in December 31st, 2015, one would expect there to be more strain on the system because of the underworking plumbing with the banks and the commercial banks and the financial institutions and hedge funds at the end of this time period. And the article goes on to talk about this. Scott Skyrim, Executive Vice President in Fixed Income and Repo at Curvature Securities, said that the fact the volumes are this huge in a non-month end and non-quarter end period tells me that this is a distortion in the market. A little over two months ago, around mid-March, there was zero reverse repo activity. Big picture, this suggests to me that quantitative easing is done and the Fed needs to taper or reduce its purchase of U.S. Treasuries and other debt assets. But you guys know from watching my videos that the Fed has gone in to the monetary roach motel, as Peter Schiff calls it. 
Once they start quantitative easing, they can't reverse the process because our economy has become addicted to the monetary heroin. In my opinion, the Fed and the commercial banks understand this well. So they've created a system, if you want to call it that, that will continue to kick the can further and further down the road, while at the same time making the system as a whole far less stable. We're going to connect these dots in the rest of the video. Step number two, how banks' balance sheets actually work. Now, we're going to go over some basics right here that might not be so basic to most of you watching this video. And then in step number three, we're going to get into the nitty gritty, into the complex stuff that'll help you put the pieces of the puzzle together and understand how this recent repo market or reverse repo blow up that we've been seeing could potentially affect your financial future. But like I said, let's start with the basics because we have to understand how this works in order for us to understand what's happening right now in the repo market with these reverse repos with the Fed. Starts off with a normal commercial bank, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Chase, we'll call it Bank XYZ. In this case, the bank has three customers. <laughs> the average Joe, Moody the Millennial, everybody's favorite, and your friend and family member, Fred. Underneath each wonderful illustration, <laughs> we've got their, their balance sheet, the assets on the left, liabilities on the right. And then under the bank, we've got their balance sheet in three different stages. Okay, we'll start with the bank here. On the asset side, we've got a treasury, a loan, and a loan. Liabilities, deposit one, deposit two, deposit three, or the average Joe's deposit, Moody's deposit, and your friend and family member Fred's deposit, which of course are assets on their balance sheet. The liabilities on the customer's balance sheets, such as Moody and your friend and family member Fred, are loans or money they owe to the bank. And then we'll say the average Joe, he doesn't like debt at all. He's financially prudent. So he doesn't have a loan. He just has his equity. So he has $100 of net worth. And Moody and your friend and family member Fred have a $100 deposit. But they also have a $100 loan that they owe the bank. So, okay, let's think through how this would work if Moody went ahead and paid off their loan to the bank. So they're going to pay it off in full. That $100 goes to the bank. So before we go any further, I want to ask you a question. If Moody gives $100 to the bank to pay off their loan, what happens to the bank's balance sheet. See, most people I think would answer the bank's balance sheet increases. They have more assets because Moody is giving the bank $100. Therefore, the asset side of their balance sheet would increase. And I'm purposely going over this very slowly because I don't think most people, even sophisticated people, truly understand how this works. But in reality, if we just think it through, if Moody pays the bank $100, the bank's balance sheet doesn't increase. The bank's balance sheet decreases because the $100 was a liability of the bank to begin with. That's all these dollars are. That's why I say they're always fugazis, right? They just don't exist. They're like pixie dust. They're not green pieces of paper. Fugazi, it's a wazi, it's a woozy, it's a 
fairy dust. It doesn't exist. It's never landed. It is no matter. It's not on the elemental chart. These assets, deposits, $100 deposits, the customers have are just simply electronic liabilities of the bank. So if Moody gives the bank $100, they're not really giving the bank anything because the bank already has it. The only thing the bank is doing is deleting Moody's deposit because it goes from $100 down to zero. So you see what would happen is once Moody pays the bank and they delete her deposit, or ah, I'm assuming it's a girl and I don't know their pronouns. <laughs> Sorry, Moody. Once the bank deletes their deposit, of $100, now the bank's balance sheet has one less loan on the asset side because Moody paid it off, but it also has one less deposit of $100. Now, what would happen if the average Joe took his $100 and bought the treasury from the bank? Is he giving the bank $100? No, the bank already has the $100 in the form of a liability to Joe. So it's the exact same thing that happened in the process with Moody. If Joe buys this treasury to the bank, that treasury leaves the asset side of the bank's balance sheet and goes over to the asset side of Joe's balance sheet. And all the bank does is take that deposit Joe had from $100 down to zero. Again, their balance sheet decreases as a result of one of their customers, quote unquote, giving them money. But just reiterate, the customers really aren't giving them anything because that money, if you want to look at it that way, was always sitting at the bank in the form of a bank liability. And now you may be saying to yourself, okay, George, I get it. But what does that have to do with this recent blow up that we've had in the repo market with the Fed executing all of these reverse repos with the commercial banking system? Let me give you a little teaser. What is a reverse repo? It's simply when a commercial bank or a financial institution agrees to buy treasuries from the Fed for a specific amount of time and then trade back. Just like Joe bought the treasuries from the commercial bank and their balance sheet decreased in size, what would technically happen if a commercial bank did a reverse repo with the Fed? What would happen to the Fed's balance sheet? <laughs> I think you guys get it. The Fed's balance sheet would reduce in size if the relationship between the commercial banking system and the Fed wasn't a game of smoke and mirrors. But I think it is a game of smoke and mirrors. And I believe these warning signs that we saw in step number one with the reverse repo transactions show us that this is simply a matter of the Wizard of Oz. Do you presume to criticize the great Oz, you ungrateful creatures? When you pull back the drape, there's really not a big scary monster that has control over everything, but just some little guy that's trying to make you believe in things that really don't exist. Step number three, the smoke and mirrors game exposed. Let's review how this reverse repo works. We've got the Fed here, bank here. Balance sheet of the Fed starts with a treasury and a deposit, the bank reserves for bank, we'll call it XYZ ABC. What happens in a reverse repo is the bank agrees to lend the Fed money. <laughs> and then the Fed for collateral gives the bank the treasuries, and the next day, the next two weeks, the next 30 days, they just go ahead and swap. But technically, it is a purchase. The bank is buying the treasuries from the Fed. 
And when the Fed buys the treasuries back, they're buying them at a slightly higher price. So that's kind of the interest rate, if you will, for borrowing the money if you're looking at it from the position of the Fed. But going back to step number two, what we realized is if the bank is going to give the Fed money, just like Moody paid off their loan, or the average Joe bought the treasury from the bank who had their money as an electronic liability in the first place, the balance sheet of the entity that received the payment would actually shrink. It would not increase because they're not taking additional money. They're just deleting a certain amount of money that was owed to the person that paid them in the first place. So after the reverse repo transaction, if this was not a smoke and mirrors game, <laughs> what would happen? is the Fed balance sheet would not have a treasury or a deposit. The deposit would be deleted, assuming that they had the exact same amount of money in their account that they were buying the treasury for. And then the treasury would go from the asset side of the Fed's balance sheet to the asset side of the bank's balance sheet. This is how it should happen. But what I'm going to reveal right now is this is not the way it's happening. For more on that, Let's go right to the internet. Let's start by going straight to the New York Fed's website where they describe the process of the reverse repo transaction. When the desk, which is their trading desk, conducts reverse repo open market operations, it sells securities held in the SOMA portfolio, which is the system open market account, to eligible reverse repo counterparties such as the commercial banks, with an agreement to buy the asset back on the reverse repo specified maturity date. This leaves the SOMA portfolio the same size. So hopefully you guys are scratching your head right now and say, wait a minute here. If they sold the treasury, how is their portfolio the exact same size? If you just sold a piece of gold that you had, well, your portfolio would no longer have that piece of gold. <laughs> Sounds pretty basic, doesn't it? Let's continue. As securities sold temporarily under the repurchase agreements continue to be shown as assets held by the SOMA. So you see what's happening is they're selling those treasuries to the bank, but they're keeping the treasuries as an asset on their balance sheet. So the size of their balance sheet doesn't change like it should in a normal transaction between you and your commercial bank. Here's more evidence. Let's go to another Fed website. This is federalreserve.gov, where they talk about overnight reverse repos, this facility they set up. The first thing I want to point out is a statement they made that really proves once they start the monetary heroin, they cannot stop. The committee stated that it would use an overnight reverse repo facility only to the extent necessary and will phase it out when it no longer is needed to help control the funds rate. I want to point out this was written in 2014. So the question becomes, when are they going to phase this out? <laughs> the answer, obviously, now seven years later, is never. They cannot phase it out. Just like they can't stop QE and just like the government can't stop stimulus. But more specifically regarding the topic at hand, these reverse repos, this transaction does not affect the size of the SOMA portfolio, which is what we were just talking about. But there is a reduction in the reserve balances on the liability side of the Fed's balance sheet. So if you're following here, you're probably asking yourself, okay, well, how does that work? How can they keep the asset but reduce the liability? 
And the liability again is the quote unquote money that the bank is actually paying them for the treasury in the first place. And here's your answer. Let's go ahead and repeat this statement again so we're all clear. But there is a reduction in the reserve balance on the liability side of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet and a corresponding increase in the reverse repo obligations while the trade is outstanding. So what they're saying is they've got accounts for those banks, and then they, which is a liability, and they've got another account, which is a liability. So they just kind of move those bank reserves quickly from one account just down to the other account. But again, the size of the balance sheet on the asset side and the liability side of the Fed does not change with these reverse repos. The only thing that changes is the commercial bank's ability to use that treasury to make profit in the marketplace with further financial engineering. I'd also like to point out the Fed is increasing the limit of the reverse repo transactions allowed for the commercial banks themselves. Check this out. In this year's March policy meeting, the Fed raised the amount counterparties can lend. In other words, the amount of treasuries they can buy from the Fed to $80 billion from $30 billion. So it almost makes it seem as though the Fed will just allow the commercial banks to use their balance sheet at will. It really makes you scratch your head and think that maybe, just maybe, all of these balance sheets are being used for one single purpose. And it's like they've merged all the balance sheets of the financial institutions in the Fed into one, and either the Fed or the commercial banks just use whatever is on that balance sheet at their will, at their discretion, just to increase their profits at the risk of making the entire system more unstable. So now let's review exactly what the Fed's website was saying right here on the whiteboard. When we start with the treasury and the deposit, of the bank reserves as an asset and liability of the Fed, and those bank reserves as an asset of the banking system, after the reverse repo has been done, the balance sheets are identical. The treasury is still an asset of the Fed. The bank reserves are still a liability of the Fed and an asset of the commercial bank. But what has happened is the bank takes the treasury and basically pretends that it's on its balance sheet and that it owns it legally. And then they sell it into the treasury market. Let's just say they're selling it to sell it short because they think interest rates are going up. Therefore, prices of bonds, treasuries are going down. Then what happens is a financial institution buys the treasury that the bank just sold. So let's think this through. After this entire process is done, the financial institution would have the treasury as an asset on their balance sheet, but so would the Fed. And the deposits, the bank reserves that the bank had originally are still there as an asset on their balance sheet and a liability of the Fed. So what is this telling us? Well, let's take one more step. If you combine the balance sheets of all three entities involved, what does it look like? You've got one treasury and one bank reserve deposit. The exact same thing that we had to begin with. So the big idea, the main takeaway that I'm trying to communicate to you is that what has effectively happened and what this reverse repo market warning sign has shown us is that there's really only 
one balance sheet in the financial system. They've merged everything. It's central control or central planning on steroids. It's basically one balance sheet and it's just used by whatever entity needs the assets or the liabilities in order to kick the can down the road and keep the music playing in this musical game of financial and economic chairs that eventually has got to come to an end. So if there's only one balance sheet, the question becomes who is in charge of the balance sheet? Currently, I would argue it's the commercial banksters, the Jamie Dimon types. But I think the Fed realizes this dynamic. It should be blatantly obvious to them. If I can figure this out, hopefully they can figure this out. And I think there's going to be a power grab where the Fed is most likely going to try to take control of this universal financial balance sheet through the form of a central bank digital currency. There are no certainties. There are only probabilities. But I like to outline what's going on behind the scenes in these videos so you can determine what the probabilities are on your own and make better financial decisions for your future. For more content that'll help you build wealth and thrive in a world of out of control central banks and big governments, check out this playlist right here and I will see you on the next video.